real privilege uh, to introduce this session uh, because if we were speaking about these issues approximately 100 years ago as maternity was in full swing, as a concept we would have thought religion, we would have thought the nation state was all essential to our thinking. Um, but at points, uh, the ideas that we sort of held true sometimes collapse or implode on themselves. And sometimes they do that, and they often do that, in the most violent of circumstances, such as in Syria, where we see that religion has not disappeared into some dark corner, that we see that the state as an idea is not necessarily as secure or as whole as we always see fit. And one of the key points of these tension are the development and re-emergence, often into our consciousness, of different groups that we'll be talking about with the two panelists today. So I'm gonna take no further time because I want the speakers to have as much time as they can to speak. And we'll start firstly with Raphael, um, who will come and speak for about 25 minutes and then we'll have after him, Mahan, uh, Mahanan, Mahan, Mahan, Mahaf, sorry, sorry, I was gonna say Mahaf in Indonesian. Um, <laughs> that's what happens when you cross languages and, as an Indonesianist. Anyway, so uh, we'll also have time for questions at the end, so if you're, please think through and uh, get ready for some interesting discussion at the end, and we'll start with um, Raphael first. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I also want to thank uh, Linda and Huda for organizing this really interesting conference. I guess one of the things that I've taken away so far, thank you, is um, the variety of perspectives that were being offered from different scholars on a range of topics to help, an, to help us understand a little bit better the complexity of this crisis. Variety of perspectives from the economy and foreign policy to the crisis of the state we talked about yesterday. And what I'm gonna try to do within the next 20 to 25 minutes is gonna be to look at this crisis within the long durée, uh, within a little bit the long history called time and try to look at it through the lenses in particular of the history of opposition between the Syrian regime and the Islamist opposition. Uh, the main point that I'm gonna make throughout the next 20 to 25 minutes is gonna be that the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood which uh, led the opposition to the regime in the 1980s has lost much of its influence, but that its legacy, both ideological and historical, is still alive in Syria today. So the first part of my talk, there are three parts. The first section is gonna look a little bit in, uh, more deeply at the Muslim Brotherhood-led jihad of the 1980s. The Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, it's worth emphasizing at first, um, while being designated as a terrorist organization in Syria since 1980, actually had no history of prior involvement in armed violence, in armed activities in Syria prior to the Ba'ath takeover of 1963. The Syrian Muslim Brotherhood was created as a political party, not as a militia, in 1946 in the wake of Syria's independence. The Muslim Brothers right away recognized uh, the legitimacy of the Syrian state, of Syrian institutions, never sought to challenge uh, borders or, or the institutions themselves, and they ran for elections as early as 1949, got three MPs, two ministers, and therefore were the first Muslim Brotherhood branch in the whole Middle East to actually be uh, elected and active in parliament and in government. Of course, they were forced underground rapidly thereafter during the time of Shukri Kuwaitli, during, during the time of Hosni Zaim during the time of the United Arab Republic, uh, but even then, they did not resort to violence. Things, of course, slowly changed. They slowly changed after the 1963 Ba'ath Party takeover of Syria. And they changed, they changed quite rapidly, because barely a year later, in 1964, there were uprisings in the city of Hama, led by the Muslim Brotherhood, and in particular, led by an Islamic, Islamist militant from the Muslim Brotherhood called Marwan Hadid, who would later become uh, the hero of Syria's jihadis. Ostensibly, the 1964 uprisings in the city of Hama took the garb of a clash of ideologies, a clash between the secular, some say atheist, Ba'ath Party and the Islamism of the Muslim Brotherhood, 
But what it really was about was a clash of constituencies, a social clash, a clash between Muslim brothers who were very often petty traders in the souks of the big cities, Homs, Hama, Idlib, Damascus, Aleppo. They were members of the urban middle class and they clashed with members of the Ba'ath Party who of course had a very different sociological profile. They were very often uh, from rural origins, from the lower middle class, and they were promoted to positions of power, both in society and in the regime, uh, by the Ba'ath Party. So what we had in 1964 in Hama was not just a clash of ideologies, but really a clash that had much to do with the traditional cleavages of Syrian society, like city versus countryside, like traders versus peasants, and so on and so forth. And so in subsequent years, clashes continued occurring between Muslim Brotherhood sympathizers and the Ba'ath regime. They occurred in 1968 again, they occurred in 1973 again, essentially focusing on Hama. But slowly, but surely, they started spreading to the rest of the country. By 1980, hundreds of thousands of people were marching against the regime, not only in Hama, but in Homs, in Idlib, in Aleppo, in Jisal al shurur in other cities of Syria. And what triggered these clashes at the national-wide level were two additional grievances, two additional factors. The first of which was the rise of the Alawi-dominated faction in the military, a trend that actually predated Hafez al-Assad because it really started in 1966, as Nicolas Van Damme shows, um, with the rise of Salah Jadid. But it really culminated with the uh, takeover of Syria by Hafez al-Assad in 1970, and it gave rise to a sense of Sunni disempowerment gave rise to a sense of Sunni disempowerment, and it's quite paradoxical because, and that's the second factor, in a way, Hafez al-Assad initiated uh, a measure of economic liberalization, we talked about it yesterday, and this actually benefited overwhelmingly to Sunni traders from Damascus, but from Damascus and from essentially Damascus. And so notables and traders in the northern cities of Hama, Idlib, Delezor, Aleppo, Soon, soon, fell, uh, soon felt uh, marginalized in the new uh, political and economic system. And it gave again the sense that northern Syria this time was being marginalized. And so the Muslim Brotherhood by the late 1970s really came to embody not only all of these talks about Islamist ideology and so on and so forth, but also this Sunni, therefore sectarian, northern, therefore geographical, regional uh, opposition to the Assad regime. But in practice, on the ground, what really happened back then, because these were crucial times uh, for Syrian history and at the time for the Ba'ath Party, for the Syrian regime, which seemed on the brink of collapse. Well, just like over the past few years, the, regime, the regime's immediate response was massive repression. Thousands of people were killed in a June 1980 crackdown on Aleppo. We often talk about Hama, but in Aleppo in June 1980, lots of people died as well. And to make their message very, very, very clear, uh, the hardliners within the Syrian regime, led by Hafez al-Assad's younger brother, Rifat, sent a killed team from the Syria Difa, the defense companies, to the Palmyra prison in the desert of Syria, where Syrian soldiers entered cells and gunned down between 800 and 1,000 prisoners, most of them thought to belong to the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood, much like the opposition since 2012, reacted in a way by claiming the right to self-defense. They declared jihad uh, barely two months after the Palmyra prison massacre in October 1980. The problem, of course, was that soon enough, this self-defense um, transformed into a campaign of sectarian retribution against the Alawis. And this trend, this particular trend, was itself reinforced by the rise of the Fighting Vanguard. The Fighting Vanguard was a network of Islamist militants led by Marwan Hadid, a Muslim brother from Hama that I talked about a few minutes ago who led the 1964 Hama uprisings. He by the early 1970s had left the Muslim Brotherhood as he thought the Muslim Brotherhood was not radical enough, was not militant enough in its opposition to the Syrian regime. And so the fighting vanguard from the early mid 1970s onwards really started targeting regime personalities 
whether they were Sunni or Alawis at, the, at first. Uh, they tried to assassinate Hafez al-Assad. They uh, were more successful in killing the uh, chief security of the Muhammad in Hama, and so on and so forth. There were many targeted killings. But through the repression of the late 1970s, what happened was that these targeted killings of regime officials turned into indiscriminate anti-Alawi sectarian attacks. And this trend culminated with a seminal moment in Syrian history, which was the June 1979 fighting vanguard attack on the Aleppo Artillery School. During this attack, a fighting vanguard commander, Ibrahim Youssef, entered the Aleppo Artillery School, of which he was actually underground a member. He was a captain in the Syrian army and also a militant for the fighting vanguard uh, uh, secretly, entered the Aleppo Artillery School and uh, with a team of gunmen loyal, loyal to him, forcibly separated the Sunni cadets from the Alawi cadets <coughs> before gunning down all of the Alawi cadets. 83 uh, were killed that day. The Muslim Brotherhood was blamed for the incident, even though it denied right away its participation in it, even uh, denounced the attack. Um, but it was blamed and by the regime, and the regime passed, weeks later, the infamous Law Number no. 49, which condemned to the death penalty any known members of the Muslim Brotherhood. And so if the regime's <coughs> goal was to radicalize the Muslim Brotherhood, then it surely succeeded. Because the Muslim Brotherhood entered right away into an alliance with the fighting vanguard to overthrow the regime militarily and once and for all. To the Syrian Muslim Brothers, it seemed that allying with the fighting vanguard had major benefits, on the face of it at least. On the one hand, indeed, the Muslim Brothers could therefore capitalize on the fighting vanguard's military successes because the fighting vanguard was so much more skilled at leading uh, paramilitary operations against the regime. Uh, at the time, the fighting vanguard was better trained. Uh, they were um, a group of hardened militants and they were also widely respected in their own local Sunni communities for being heroes, in a way. On the other hand, the fighting vanguard provided the Muslim Brotherhood, which was at, at the time already an aging organization um, full of people, well, aging people who basically did not appeal as much as they used to to the youth. The Fighting Vanguard was a youth-based organization, and so allying with it allowed the Muslim Brotherhood to secure uh, a new pool of potentially uh, uh, young recruits. But of course, there were downsides to this alliance, and very powerful downsides, and these downsides soon superseded the benefits. And there were three main downsides. The first of which was that while many Fighting Vanguard commanders had roots in the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, they came to disagree with the organization on a range of topics. They disagreed on a range of topics from democracy to um, minority rights to the shape that the future Syrian state uh, should assume in case Hafez al-Assad was going to be overthrown. And so these ideological differences eventually weakened the alliance between the fighting vanguard and the Muslim Brothers. Second, the Muslim Brotherhood really thought that in a naive way, I guess, that by allying with the fighting vanguard, it will be able to hold leverage on the jihadi organization and shape some of its policies. But the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood leadership soon became frustrated because far from becoming more cooperative, the fighting vanguard, in fact, increased the number of the unilateral operations they were, carried, they were carrying out at the time. And that was, in particular, I think, the product of the personality of the leader of the fighting vanguard at the time, Adnan Okla, who was a successor of Marwan Hadid, uh, who, who felt very much in competition with the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and therefore organizational differences between the two groups uh, came to uh, overcome the alliance. And last but not least, this alliance uh, cost the Muslim Brotherhood its constituencies. Because the alliance with the jihadis alienated many Sunni traders, many Sunni bourgeois who had before uh, supported the Muslim Brotherhood and large sections of the middle class who didn't have an interest in this prolonged period of economic and political instability and this sectarian sense of a sectarian civil war uh, uh, coming to grip Syria. And so I, give, I guess all of these dynamics really gave a free reign for a massive regime crackdown on the opposition stronghold, Hama, 
in February 1982. The scale of the repression that happened then, with regime tanks shelling the city for a whole month and then entering and, in a way, cleaning the city of Muslim Brothers for weeks and weeks, the scale of the repression that happened then was so bad, so high, that it's still very difficult to accurately assess the, the exact death toll uh, that occurred then. Um, in any case, the conservative estimate is 15,000 deaths uh, during the whole month of February 92, but this is really the conservative estimate uh, reports by Amnesty International and uh, by other organizations suggest that the death toll may be as high as 25,000 deaths. The Syrian Human Rights Committee, which is close to the Muslim Brotherhood, says 40,000 deaths. Um, of course, there were many rapes and, and horrible uh, acts, kids being killed, and so on and so forth. In fact, it may have been so such a dark episode of Syrian history that uh, the regime uh, basically for 30 years afterwards never really talked about what happened then and only referred to the events of Hama as al-Hadas, the events, um, nothing more than a black box, a taboo of Syrian history. And so fast forward to 2011, the main actor of the uprisings of the 1980s, the Muslim Brotherhood, was forced in exile. Uh, the fighting vanguard as well, the fighting vanguard for its part splintered and ceased to exist. The Muslim Brotherhood in exile continued to exist, continued its opposition to the Syrian regime, but, but never really had any uh, influence over the course of Syrian politics. It had to wait until 2011 uh, for Muslim Brothers to uh, be able to go back to Syria and of course to the rebel-held uh, parts of the country. At first it seemed like the Muslim Brotherhood's historical opposition to the Syrian regime will secure the organization uh, some degree of influence in the new Syria. In fact, they became very active in the revolution uh, in three different respects, at least. Politically, first of all. Politically, they gained uh, a degree of influence over exiled opposition bodies from the Syrian National Council to the National Coalition. Um, they did so by voting as a bloc at the time when uh, the Syrian opposition was really fragmented. They did so also by allying with factions that had a sociological profile very different from theirs. They allied with Georges Sabra, who's a Christian Marxist. They allied with Burhan Khalion, who's a secular Sunni, with Abdel Basit Sieda, who's a Kurdish academic. Uh, and, and so I guess these uh, alliances of convenience uh, helped the Brotherhood secure a degree of political influence. At the humanitarian level then, they also became quite active, in particular at the Syrian-Turkish border, where their relief arm, Atta relief, uh, is, uh, according to uh, even non-Muslim brothers, uh, one of the most active uh, organization uh, over there, uh, helping the Syrian refugees at the Syrian-Turkish border. Muslim brothers are also fairly active when it comes to the realm of the media, of social media. Um, they have, over the past four years, created uh, or, or their affiliates have created a TV station in Aleppo, uh, a radio station broadcasting between Idlib and Aleppo, uh, a monthly newspaper distributed in liberated areas. Their youth are also very active in the Syrian Revolution Facebook page and other social media. But despite all of these activities, it became very obvious that uh, soon enough, uh, the brothers uh, were met by limits to their influence. And I think this is mainly the product of the mistrust of Syrian society after 30 years of exile, 30 years of absence, um, um, Syrian society, whether we're talking about uh, conservative Sunnis or secular Sunnis, in Aleppo or Damascus, Alawis of course, members of the minorities, um, uh, it seems that the Brotherhood has lost a lot uh, of its previous uh, constituents or a lot of trust in Syrian society as a, as, as a whole. And finally, Despite the fact that the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood has lost this influence on the ground, its legacy is, in a way, still very much alive. Its ideological legacy, first of all. We often characterize uh, contemporary Syrian rebel politics as being dominated by Salafis. And this is true to a certain extent. Uh, Salafi rebel factions like Ahra al-Sham and others uh, hold a major sway in Syrian rebel politics. But um, what comes next after them is Muslim Brotherhood-type uh, Islamist groups 
uh, groups that do not have organizational ties to the Muslim Brothers, but that have ideological affinities with the way of thinking of the Muslim Brotherhood and sometimes personal ties uh, between leaders of, of, of the Muslim Brotherhood and these rebel factions. I'm thinking of four major groups uh, that are active at the moment in Syria. The first one is not as active as it used to be, it's Liwet Tawhid, which used to be active in, in Aleppo, um, a moderate Islamist rebel faction uh, that embodies a little bit the uh, Aleppine countryside uh, Sunni rural uh, mindset, Liwet Tawhid, Jaish al-Mujahideen, which is still very much active today in Syria, in Aleppo again, uh, Ajnad al-Sham, which is more active in Damascus for its part, and Failak al-Sham, which is active in basically northern Homs, northern, northern Homs countryside, northern Hama countryside, Idlib, Idlib countryside, Latakia, and Aleppo. What these groups have in common is that, as I said, they are not part of the Muslim Brotherhood, but they are claiming, in a way, its ideological heritage. Um, they refer to the Brotherhood's dual legacy of opposing the Syrian regime and at the <coughs> same time wanting a stake in the future system by uh, stating that they will participate in parliamentary politics and respect minority rights. They're often close to Turkey as well, the AK party and Turkish military intelligence. And when it comes to their action on the ground, it's worth noting that they are very much anti-regime, but that they are also very much anti-ISIS. Uh, in fact, right now, in the past three days, um, one of these uh, uh, factions, Failak al-Sham, has been very active both in northern Hama countryside against the regime and in northern Aleppo countryside against ISIS. The second legacy that the Brotherhood, the final legacy that the Brotherhood has left behind is a historical legacy. Because the narrative of the jihad of the Muslim Brothers and of the fighting vanguard militants of the 1980s is increasingly being used in rebel militant circles today as a tool of propaganda. And this is particularly the case, unsurprisingly, in the city of Hama. The city of Hama where some rebel groups have used memories of the massacre to recruit locals and mobilize fighters. And that's something really interesting about uh, rebel politics and rebel uh, rhetoric. There was a very interesting uh, video that I just want to talk about for one or two minutes, a very interesting video released a year ago by the group Ahra Sham, which is a Salafi rebel group, as I said before, uh, very important in Syria today. They released a video a year ago about the Hama massacre. It's a 17 minutes video. Whoever wants to have a look at it, I'll send you after the link, after the conference. Extremely interesting video, supposed to be a documentary, but of course a very biased one. 17 minutes video during which um, uh, the, the speaker in the background with images of the massacre unfolding and, and, and also of the revolution today and since 2011, the speaker uh, makes three very interesting remarks, three very interesting points that I want to talk about very briefly right now as a means of conclusion. The first point that the speaker makes is that she really tries to draw parallels between uh, the jihad of the 1980s and the revolution of 2011-2012. He says something really powerful. He says, the people marching in 2012 are the sons of those who died in 1982. He says something uh, else that is also very interesting. He tries to stir up very clearly urban pride by referring to Hama as the city of the rebellion, those who rose against all tyrants ever since the French in 1925. And that is also very powerful. And he concludes on this urban pride note by saying, again, in a very powerful way, that the Orontes, the river of Hama, is the pride of the people of Sham, thereby casting Hama as the pride of greater Syria. And finally, what he does, that is again very powerful, is trying to recruit locals by stoking up feelings of anger for the 1982 massacres, feelings of revenge. And that becomes very clear when he concludes the video by promising that if the Mujahideen join Ahra al-Sham, Ahra al-Sham will help the Mujahideen, and I quote, fill the river of the Orontes with the blood of revenge. And so I just want to conclude on that note to say that this video really says much about rebel identity, rebel rhetoric. We talk about Islamism, uh, but very often it's not all about Islamism as a concept or sectarianism as a concept. It's also about um, 
features that have much to do with Syrian history, with Syrian tradition, Syrian society, like urban pride. Urban pride is a very powerful uh, a feature of Syrian politics, whether it's from Damascus, Homs, Halep, uh, Halab, uh, other cities. Uh, people are very proud where they're coming from. And urban history, urban identity shapes their overall political identity, whether it's through the prism of Islamism or other political ideologies. Of course, this video also shows that the rewriting of history is becoming a major issue in uh, Syrian politics and is likely to remain even after the fall of the uh, Assad regime or the end of the civil war. And um, this feeling of taking revenge for 1982, I think, is also a very powerful one. Thank you very much. Um, oh, now I'm so short, I can't even clearly be seen. Um, that was a wonderful. And what we're going to go to now is we're transferring what's been discussed and will be discussed in this panel is all about memory and narratives and the different constructions that those can receive. We're going to move now from looking at the Muslim Brotherhood to looking at um, Hezbollah, which have different ones again, memories and narratives. And I'd like to invite um, Mohanad to speak. Um, to better understand and better capture the nuances of the history of Hezbollah and Assad's uh, relations, I will phase them into three uh, different phases. Speak up, yeah. Um, and in doing so, I will follow Halliday's, uh, Fred Halliday's three level analysis in the Middle East's uh, international relations um, for a better, more suitable framework away from the essentialist and sectarian-based um, analysis of, of, this, uh, of these relations. <clears throat> Firstly, the interaction of global structures of power, namely the end of the Cold War, resulting in initiating the peace process between Syria and the Assad regime. The second level is that of the, international, the, of the regional state and non-state players, specifically the dynamics of Iranian-Syrian relations and alliances. These are a factor of Damascus's Arab relations and um, Lebanon influence. Iran is Hezbollah's primary funder, military backer, and the organization is committed by faith and ideology to the Wilayat al-Faqih doctrine, placing the Iranian supreme leader on the top of its hierarchy. The third level is a salient assumption that sectarian identities and ideologies are second to the various parties' interests. Halliday rightly contends that while the belief systems, ideologies, norms of the region um, draw selectively on the past, they are not traditional but modern phenomena that have to be related to the interests of these contemporary states and their apparatus. The, the assumption that these identities are quite modern and they're politicized leads us to separating um, the analysis of this historical relationship from the sectarian narratives that we have. Um, the Hezbollah-Syrian relations have always mirrored the Tehran-Damascus alliances and quite often tensions and rivalries between the two states. The first early a turbulent phase, which started in the 1980s. Um, although diplomatic relations between Iran and Syria in that phase were established um, long before uh, that, uh, but a year, a, a year after the uh, Iranian, uh, a year after the Syrian independence, um, we had this uh, tensions uh, between uh, Iran and Syria based on the latter's Arabist and Arab nationalist governments. Uh, the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, a US ally and an, 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 an Iranian nationalist, was at odds with the successive pro-Soviet, pan-Arab uh, nationalist governments in Damascus. Due to the tensions between Damascus and Baghdad and Syria's increased isolation in the region in light of Anwar Sadat's rapprochement with Israel, the Assad regime embarked on high-level exchanges with Imperial Iran before the Iranian Revolution. 
starting from 1974. The exchanges culminated in a state visit by Assad to Tehran in, in December 1975. Since both countries had major differences, especially over Egypt's engagement in the peace process, with the Shah fully supporting Egypt's Anwar Sadat, the renewed relationship had little impact on the regional alliances. In the last half of the 1970s, the Syrian regime forged strong relations with the Iranian opposition through the rising Lebanese-Iranian uh, Shia leader, Imam Musa Sadr, who later formed the Amman movement. Al-Sadr, seeking a new ally for his, Shia, for his new Shia group, the Amman movement, developed strong ties with the Syrian regime. The Syrian regime did not share the Iraqi regime and Gulf states' worries about the revolution's exploits to the Shia populations. On the contrary, the Syrian regime had an intrinsic interest in undermining Saddam Hussein's regime, given the rising tensions between the two Ba'athist rivals. Such a relationship paved the way for the rise of Hezbollah in Lebanon, Syria's backyard, in 1982. The Syrian regime allowed several hundred members of the elite Iranian Revolutionary Guards to enter Lebanon's eastern Bekaa Valley. They established the first training camp for Hezbollah, producing its first batch of fighters. While the organization issued its first public declaration in 1985, its first cells were engaged in attacks against the Israeli occupation forces and its US and French allies in Beirut. Hezbollah engaged in kidnapping operations against foreigners. Internally, the organization dedicated some of its operations against the Christian militias and was accused of participating in the liquidation campaign of Lebanese communist cadres, including two prominent intellectuals of Shia background, Sheikh Hassan Brui, who was a Shia cleric before he became a communist, and Hassan Hamdan, known as Mahdi Amr. By the end of the Cold War, however, the Syrian regime had become a rapprochement towards the West, first through ending the internal conflict in Western Beirut, and second through ending the Western hostage crisis in Lebanon. This ca came at a price because the Syrian regime had to enter some form of fighting and violence against Hezbollah. This rapprochement was at conflict with Iranian interests at the time. Iran was still in conflict with Iraq and still had some uh, sorting tensions with the West. On February 24, 1987, the Syrian army committed a massacre against Hezbollah militants, although they were not previously involved in interparty fighting. In the words of Naim Qasim, the deputy leader of the organization, Syrian forces entered Beirut on February 24, 1987, with the aim of putting an end to raging inter-party strife in the city, in which Hezbollah took no part. In the midst of a tense atmosphere, the Syrian army force infiltrated a building on Fatallah Street, where a number of Hezbollah members stayed and committed a massacre, resulting in 27 martyrs for the party. An impasse ensued, yet Hezbollah restrained its members from taking any reactive measures, lest they become embroiled in strife and turmoil. Normalization of relationships uh, was achieved after a while, although sorrow over the event persists. Still, till this day, the uh, memory of the Fatallah massacre in 1987 remains among the party members, and it's widely seen as a negative, um, as always a negative impediment in the relationship and in the uh, alliance with the Syrian regime. A war after the Fatallah regime, after the Fatallah massacre, a war between the Syria-backed Amal movement and the Iran-backed Hezbollah erupted in full force. While this dark era in the relation between Hezbollah and Syria is rarely acknowledged, considering the current alliance, Qasim made a subtle statement in his book about this um, strong uh, anti-Syrian sentiment and, and uh, doubts of the Syrian regime's intentions. The June 1988 clashes between Amal and Hezbollah prompted a decision by Syrian forces to infiltrate Beirut's southern suburbs under the banner of separating the fighting parties and re-establishing security. 
Hezbollah had many concerns, the main one being a possible siding of Syrian troops with Amal. <clears throat> Amal and Hezbollah tensions rose, leading to clashes which at, time, at times involved the Syrian arm, armed forces against Hezbollah and with Amal. In 1986, May, clashes between the two sides left three Hezbollah members and two Syrian soldiers dead. As the Syrian army made an attempt to rescue hostages from the Sheikh Abdullah barracks, um, following these clashes, Hezbollah kidnapped two Syrian officers, and the Syrian army reacted by detaining several of their members. Such classes, clashes per persisted, leading to an all-out war with the Syrian-backed Amal movement in the southern suburbs of Beirut, the south, and the Bekaa Valley. The Syrian regime's wariness against the role of Hezbollah and the role of Iran in Lebanon was also related to its uh, leverage in any talks with the United States and with uh, in the um, Israeli-Syrian uh, peace process. So the, uh, in the, in the words of uh, Syrian diplomats who spoke to the New York Times on the eve of the 1994 meeting between Assad and U.S. President Bill Clinton in Geneva. Um, they said that for its part, diplomats, uh, Syrian diplomats, that uh, believe, they believe that Syria owed more from the United States, not only for its help with the, to the Allied coalition during the Persian <coughs> Gulf, War, Gulf War, but by keeping a lid on terrorist groups playing a role in the release of American hostages held in Lebanon and making the Madrid Peace Conference possible by agreeing to, jo to join the peace process in 1991. So in a sense, the Syrian regime was engaged in, a, in an intended um, uh, sort of effort to keep a lid on Hezbollah and contain their activities in Lebanon. Part of a calculated strategy, the Assad regime had kept Hezbollah under check. For instance, Antony Lake, President Clinton's national security advisor, noted in a lecture uh, the Assad tensions with Iran and Hezbollah during the Syrian-Israeli uh, negotiations, in which there was a clear talk of the Syrian army disarming Hezbollah and containing its activities in Lebanon in return for a peace um, agreement uh, with, with Israel. On the other side, the Israeli-Syrian negotiations were a very worrying instance to Hezbollah as these negotiations fell within the Assad strategy of accepting peace with Israel after uh, its withdrawal to the pre-1967 borders. The Syrian leader had a more pragmatic approach than Hezbollah's ideological uh, stance on the issue, which is basically freeing all of uh, the Palestinian occupied region um, uh, lands. After the Assad um, death in 2000, <coughs> the new Syrian president started establishing its relations um, with Hezbollah. It only started changing um, towards Hezbollah's side, tipping the balance uh, to the Lebanese organization's side after the uh, U.S. said invasion of Iraq in 2003. Also, in the, after the assassination, this culminated, this process of 2003, cooperating with Hezbollah against the American occupation of Iraq. It culminated in 2005, after the assassination of the Lebanese Prime Minister, Rafi Hariri, in February 14, 2005. Because this led to wide anti-Syrian demonstrations, which culminated also in uh, March 14. Before that, Hezbollah played a really leading role in countering and politically containing the popular anti-Syrian movement, organizing a major demonstration on March 8, which was about six days before the major March 14 demonstration. This drew hundreds of thousands of supporters the two major demonstrations 
highlighted the extent of the split in the country between the two camps. <coughs> Hezbollah's new role cemented a new era in the relationship with the regime, especially after the withdrawal of its forces in April 26. The organization was no longer the junior partner of the Assad regime and this alliance. Nevertheless, the Syrian withdrawal spelled the end of the regime's absolute control over Lebanon's politics, in which Hezbollah had a minimal role, restricted to limited parliamentary representation since 1992. Hezbollah afterwards joined the Lebanese government with three ministers and participated in, it led basically its alliance, uh, which is March 8, against the anti-Syrian alliance inside the government. The participation in government has been a fruit of electoral and political alliances with serious foes in Lebanon. Hezbollah took part, took part in the Quartet Alliance, Al-Hilf al rubai joining forces with Saad Hariri's Al-Mustaqbal movement, which was the major anti-Syrian uh, movement. It was led by the uh, assassinated Prime Minister's son, Walid Jumblat's PSP, and Nabih Birri's Amal movement. The elections resulted in a 14 March majority. However, the agreement preserved Hezbollah's right through the uh, coalition's government's ministerial statement. The Quartet Alliance and its government approved the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, primarily set to counter the possible Syrian influence over the course of justice on the assassination of Hariri. While preserving its alliance with the Syrian regime, Hezbollah was clearly autonomous in its decision making and priority setting from the Syrian regime. So. On the other hand, while Hezbollah was pursuing a policy of uh, following its own interests, the Syrian regime was f f followed on, continued on with its commitment to the peace process and its relations with the West. While Syria's Bashar al-Assad was committed to his alliance with Iran and Hezbollah, Damascus kept its options open. In 2007, Haaretz reported that representatives of Syria and Israel held a round of meetings in Geneva between late 2004 and July 2006. Israel and Syria, of course, denied their knowledge of the informal uh, negotiations. They were held by Alon Liel, the former director general of the Israeli Foreign Ministry, along with a US-based Syrian businessman, Ibrahim Sulaiman. I met Ibrahim Sulaiman in London and um, I was in contact with him later on, and he confirmed that the Syrian regime uh, was behind these negotiations. Um, and so did Alain Liel in various interviews uh, with the Western media. The, um, the Israeli um, media um, reported that the backing of uh, Hezbollah and Hamas was on the negotiations table, and so did Alain Liel in an article written for the Telegraph. He said that they discussed a plan to end 60 years of hostility with Israel, offering to give back the Golan Heights occupied in 1967 war in exchange for Syria ending its backing of Hamas and Hezbollah. This, this second phase ended with the Syrian um, conflict starting in 2011 and the uh, subsequent government crackdown. Um, inside Syria, Hezbollah's role was, before that, was limited to engaging in certain talks, uh, to some propaganda elements, etc. But there was no strong institutional presence inside Syria. And this was due, of course, to the Hafez Assad's uh, policy in the 1990s and 1980s, his anti-Islamist uh, stance, his wariness of Islamists, for instance, once a, um, a, an Iranian diplomat uh, wearing the traditional Islamic clothes was arrested with his wife, um, mistakenly thinking that he was a Muslim Brotherhood um, um, activist or something. So in the past, this wariness existed and it continued until the Syrian demonstration started and the Syrian conflict started. In the Iranian um, strategic support to Assad 
financially and militarily increased substantially. According to the United Nations Special Envoy to Syria, Iran annually spends $6 billion to prop up the Syrian regime financially and militarily. In addition to this support, the Iranian regime provided the Syrian army with much needed manpower in the form of Iraqi, Lebanese, Afghan, and Pakistani fighters. Following the Syrian army's uh, setback in various Syrian provinces, including Damascus itself, from 2012 to 2013, the Iranian back ground troops increasingly became a backbone of regime operations against the rebels, shifting the course of conflict to Assad's side. Particularly from the spring of 2013, these Shiite troops were introduced to various Damascus areas, such as Zrobar and Saida Zainab and to Aleppo. Afghan fighters were taking photos in these uh, areas. In the beginning, they were called Hezb al Muqawm al Afghaniya, and then later on, they took another name, which is Fatim al Yun. Um, the various Shia fighters, for instance, the Pakistani uh, Shiite fighters, also became called uh, Zainab al Yun, and then you had the Iraqi Haidar al Yun brigades. Um, Hezbollah, on the other hand, adopted Iran's approach in the media, gradually disseminating information to both its supporters' base and the outside world. In spite of various reports and rumors, the organization had denied any direct involvement in the Syrian war. Until October 2012, on that day, following the death of a Hezbollah cadre in Syria, Abu Abbas, Nasrallah acknowledged an accidental and limited engagement by helping the Syrian government forces retain control and defend 23 villages in the Qusayr region, neighbor, neighboring Lebanon's Bekaa Valley. Nasrallah's rationale was that these towns were mostly inhabited by Christians and Shiites of Lebanese origins. There's a number of, he said, there's a number of Lebanese villages inside the Syrian borders next to Al-Hirmil region. These villages are Syrian and this land is Syrian but Lebanese citizens live in these towns and villages. These Lebanese inhabited towns are 23 in addition to 12 farms. There's a list of names, and you know they, he said that they belong to different sects, etc. cetera. Um, the, the conflict then escalated, and with many, with many, with many uh, Shia fighters uh, dying, and their funerals coming to Lebanon. So the announcements and the declaration of the extent of engagement was pretty much connected to these funerals, uh, putting some pressure on Hezbollah to declare the extent of its engagement. Later on, Hassan Nasrallah uh, linked between his uh, engagement and the general fight against the Israelis and the Americans, saying that we will not allow the Syrian regime to fall. If the Syrian regime falls, the resistance backbone, the backyard, will be exposed, and then Hezbollah itself will lose the ability to defend its borders against the Israelis. But then later on, another side of uh, Hezbollah's engagement with the, uh, with the Syrian regime uh, appeared. This time, Hezbollah was building militias drawing on the uh, small Shia minority in Syria, uh, which, which is uh, basically uh, a few hundred thousand Shiites distributed between uh, the uh, reef of Homs, the province, uh, the provincial areas of Homs, and also the Aleppo uh, province. Um, there are two towns in the Aleppo province uh, known in the media as Nubul al-Zahra, Nubul al-Zahra they have a substantial Shia population, and at the same time in the Syrian and the uh, Shia suburbs of uh, Damascus and um, in neighborhoods such as Sayyidah Zainab, where you have uh, thousands of, of Shiites, they started building um, an, a sort of a new um, party, a, Syri a, Syri a Syrian Hezbollah, known later to be Syrian Hezbollah. By early 2013, um, another facet of Iran Hezbollah's involvement appeared, namely that of the Syrian Hezbollah, which draws its memberships from the comparatively small Shia minority. The Lebanese organization played a crucial role in creating its Syrian twin. So we saw 
so many uh, Hezbollah figures used as uh, martyrs and as symbols of, of these uh, uh, brigades of the Syrian Hezbollah. The earliest presence of Iranian model Shia institutions appeared with the creation of the Mahdi Scouts, a mainly educational youth militant organization providing training and indoctrination for its members. It appeared online, started posting images of its uh, activities inside Syria. And um, later on, the Shia fighters began organizing and fighting under, under multinational groups. However, in 2013, the Arrida forces, Quwat Arrida, in the Shia areas of both Homs, the city, and the province, um, especially the towns and villages surrounding, surrounding Umm al -Amd. In the Damascus suburbs, another brigade carrying the name Liwa al Sayyida uh, Ruqayya, who is a daughter of uh, Imam Hussein, the third Shia Imam, um, was established. And these two groups started referring to themselves later as the Syrian Hezbollah, or Hezbollah Suri to distinguish themselves from their Lebanese counterpart. However, their online publications suggest strong links to the Lebanese uh, branch, considering the shared martyrs, mostly, mostly trainers and Lebanese founders. The Syrian Hezbollah's online narratives, unlike, this, unlike the Lebanese Hezbollah, which doesn't really say much about what, what it thinks, uh, thinks of the Syrian regime and their forces, has always displayed these tensions with uh, the Syrian regime forces saying that these are the secular uh, guards of our populations and that the ideologically driven Hezbollah, uh, Syrian Hezbollah members are more um, capable of defending the Shia areas of Syria. The establishment of the Syrian Hezbollah marks a change not only in Lebanese uh, Shiite organizations influence in Syria, but also in the nature of Iranian-Syrian relations, ultimately giving Iran a superior hand and a role in which, which could surpass any peaceful resolution to the Syrian conflict. Last February, following the success of Shia forces, among them the Syrian Hezbollah, in breaking the siege around the towns of Nubul and Zahra in Aleppo's countryside, General Qasem Soleimani made a surprise visit. In a highly, in a highly symbolic publicity stunt, the leader of the Revolutionary Guards, Al-Quds Brigade, was photographed distributing candy to children, visiting local fighters, inaugurating, according to many commentators, a new terrain of Iranian influence in the Levant. Thank you very much. <laughs>